Welcome back to the Sci Fireplace. This is six books that I've read since the last video was published in rank order from worst to best. I am shocked to say that this wound up at the very bottom of the list. Shocked because it was written by Clifford Simak. I've only read one book by Simak, which was City, and I thought City was superb. I didn't think that such a person would be capable of producing a work such as this. It takes place in an alternate timeline where the Roman Empire coexisted with uh, an otherworldly force of ghouls and goblins and dragons called The Evil with a capital E. And it's awful. I bailed after two chapters. I just could not take it. It was written like a 10th grader would write uh, their first fantasy novel. Characters utterly uninteresting, speaking to each other in these long paragraphs of pure exposition, just reciting context to one another. It was so bad that it was simply confusing. Uh, it was like it was written by another person and then the Clifford Simak name was slapped on it by the publisher or something. Number four is, I think, probably the worst book that I've ever finished reading. It's The Summer Tree by Guy Gabriel Kay. I really struggle to not put it at the bottom of the list, even having only read two chapters of the Simak book, because this generated such feelings of anger and contempt in me. I'm making a conscious effort to read more fantasy and to seek out the good fantasy, because I know that there has to be some. And I know that this is like a celebrated book in the fantasy world, or certainly a celebrated author. I've gone back later and kind of looked into him on the internet and people say that this isn't his best book, but Kay is held up as like this exemplar of being a good prose stylist in the fantasy genre, but it's just pure cliche, overly purple prose, packed full of stupid, cliche, trite adjectives and flowery language that detracts from the reading experience, does not add to it, makes it feel very juvenile. So the basic plot is The Lord of the Rings. It's a naked ripoff of Middle Earth, repackaged, kind of shifted around a little bit with some new labels and names slapped on it, and then regurgitated back to us as a new property. It's about basically five college students that get transported to this other world that looks identical to Middle Earth and their misadventures trying to help the good citizens of the realm battle the great evil that slumbers beneath a mountain. When I was reading it, I felt like I was reading one of those old scholastic books with uh, the collection of teenagers on the cover and one of them has a flashlight. But my teacher's a wizard. It's like reading the novelization of a Disney movie replete with knights and orcs and fair maidens and courtly romances and unicorns. And then right before the book ends, we get a long, protracted, brutally violent, hyper disturbing rape scene. I'm not offering this as a criticism from a place of pearl clutching or trying to police what topics can be included in books. I can't really even put into words how over the top violent and disturbing and brutal and malicious it is. And a small part of me admires it or credits Kay with doing something narratively very risky and doing it, I think, to heighten the stakes and to make it clear that the characters in the book are fighting a true evil as opposed to the Disney-fied, cartoonified villain, his version of Sauron. I don't think that it's worth the price of admission. I just really didn't appreciate it. I just, I thought it was just a kick in the balls. It just does not belong. It does not make sense. I don't think it adds anything. Uh, it, it makes me have ill will towards the author, just in terms of not wanting to read anything else that he has written. And um, I mean, that probably would have been the case without that scene, but with that scene, it generated a feeling of real, uh, real distaste in me. So the reason I'm trying to read more fantasy is because I stumbled upon this YouTube channel that I wanna to recommend to you called The Outlaw Bookseller. He's, as the name would imply, a bookseller of many years, in fact, I think many decades, and a lifelong reader of science fiction and fantasy literature and crime literature, it's genre lit in general, and I think is the best voice that I've found. It strikes me as a true authority. And when I started watching his videos, it put into relief just how much of a neophyte I am when it comes to this stuff. I really am just a hobbyist. 
you get a very different impression watching him. I mean, he speaks with a voice of authority and he is able to speak much more eloquently, much more easily than I am about uh, these books and has a much deeper set of references for being able to speak intelligently about things, which I sometimes kind of stumble and fumble my way through doing when talking about this. And he has a lot of videos about uh, fantasy lit and a specific kind of fantasy lit from a specific era, the early sword and sorcery stuff makes it sound very interesting and very worth the time. And something that is divorced from all of these bloated high fantasy cliches that make me not want to read fantasy or have made me not want to read fantasy. And when I read stuff like this, I feel vindicated in that because it's just, it's punishing on every level when you read bad shit like this. Number four is Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner. Everything starting with this book, I genuinely loved. It's a big gulf in quality between Summer Tree and Stand on Zanzibar. It is the first John Brunner book that I've read. It is an experimental dystopian novel that is, as you can see, quite long. I think it's worth the length. It, it was slightly tedious to read, especially because it's written in an experimental style. It's written in a modernist style and apparently was modeled off of uh, the America Trilogy. I hope I got that right by John Dos Passos, who is a poet and novelist. It's uh, kind of a, uh, an incoherent narrative, a nonlinear narrative that takes a lot of artistic liberties in terms of the structuring of the words on the page, which is something that historically has kind of irritated me. And it's it did chafe just a little bit, but I, I think it's just such a good book that it, it really is worth it. It's interesting because it's such a prescient book. That's its reputation as a book that got it right in a lot of almost eerie, uncanny ways as a book that was written in 1968, or at least published in 1968, and seemed to foresee a lot of the fine grain detail and the big scope details of what the future that we now live in would look like. The book takes place in 2010. It is also kind of moored in a few period cliches. Some of the language is dated. Some of the sensibilities are clearly dated from the late 60s. Of all the dystopian books that I've read, there is only really this one and another one that I think kind of hit the nail on the head. The Iron Heel by Jack London, which was much further off the mark, but got a lot of the details right in terms of, of the political situation. And uh, this book, which really nails the feeling. It really, really hits the nail on the head to the degree that there were a lot of details that he foresaw that I missed while I was actually reading the book because I just take them so much for granted that they kind of receded into the background. And it wasn't until I went back and read later a couple of synopses or, or, or commentaries on the book that it was like, oh yeah, I can't believe that he got that right and I didn't notice it. I read this a few books back, so a lot of these details are not coming immediately to mind. But just, there, there are all these moments of like stark recognition. It's about overpopulation. It's a future where there's a close marriage between kind of the media and the state and this big unchecked corporate apparatus and everybody is highly reliant upon artificial intelligence to make their uh, their policy decisions for them. And it's a book about kind of the history of colonialism, the history of racism, history of all the isms, all the, the hot button topics that are popular in genre lit right now. Brunner did way early on and he did them very, very well. It is pretty bogged down in terminology. It's one of those books that tries to fabricate an entire lexicon of new lingo for the future. And it, it clearly was written in 1968 and it, it's just too strong of a flavor. It's too recurring in the book and it's a distraction. The plot is kind of secondary to me, to the world building, which I just think is, is excellent. And there's so much that he got right. Number three is Starfish by Peter Watts, which I read on Kindle. I love Peter Watts for many reasons. One of the reasons I love Peter Watts is that he's made all of his novels available for free on his website to download to read on e-readers, much to the apparent chagrin of his publishers. It's his first novel. I have only read Blind Sight, um, which I may now consider my favorite ever science fiction novel. Blind Sight is a true masterpiece. It is what he's best known for, and I get the impression it's it's a book that he's kind of tired of talking about. If you've never watched the Peter Watts interview before, I encourage you to do so. He's a very funny guy, uh, and I just love his sensibility. I really resonate with it. 
uh, just with him as a person and with his politics and with his general perspective and with the way that he writes, his just sensibility when he writes, it's genuinely dark in a way that's not edgelordy, it's not cheap or chintzy, it's not stunt darkness, it's, it comes from a real place of um, a sense of despair in his books. Starfish is very much that way and thematically and structurally it's quite similar to Blind Sight. It's not quite as good of a book as Blind Sight. No surprise, it is his first book. But it's just a, a great piece of world building that is laden with a lot of really fascinating hard sci-fi. And Watts is known as being an author who has a lot of footnotes in his books or explanatory clauses later after the actual narrative, talking about his research for the book and how a lot of the concepts in the book that drive the narrative are based on real science that's been done. The basic premise of the book is that there's a mega corporation that runs this facility at the bottom of the San Juan Trench. The facility is run by deeply psychologically damaged people that get recruited by the corporation and then surgically modified to be able to breathe water. And the bottom of the trench is home to sea creatures that have grown to extraordinary sizes. It's really dark. It feels a lot like an alien movie. It has such a great atmosphere and the ideas at play are really, really fascinating. And Watts, again, is just, at least to me, such an easily lovable writer. Next, I just finished this a few minutes ago. It's Behold the Man by Michael Moorcock, which I picked off the shelf or the fireplace rather because of the cover also because I was listening to Outlaw Bookseller talk about his love of Moorcock. It's the first true sci-fi book that I've read by Moorcock, and I loved it. I thought it was great. Moorcock um, is a better writer than I remember him being from the Elric books. It's about a uh, kind of a Philip Roth character, a, a sexually neurotic, I think Jewish man, traveling back in time to uh, try to meet Jesus jumps from that timeline to the pre-time travel timeline of him growing up and being subjected to all of these kind of social tortures and coming from a dysfunctional family and uh, gripping read. I chewed through probably about that much of it in one sitting and I only stopped reading because it was three in the morning and then life got really hectic and crazy and I was able to finish it in like three different sessions. So I wish I could have actually just sat down and read this all in one sitting. It was that good. It's a secular retelling of the Jesus story in a very uh, kind of outlandish and at the time probably very sensational and controversial way. Made me want to read a lot more Moorcock. And my favorite book that I read was The Dream Master by Roger Zelazny. The only other Zelazny book that I've read was Coils, which he co-wrote with Fred Saberhagen, which I really didn't care for at all. It's another simple, short book that was expanded from a short story, and you can kind of feel that. There's a few bits and pieces here and there that seem a little bit bolted on. I was so seduced by Zelazny's writing ability. There are pieces of prose in this that are on par with anything that I've I've read from any of the greats of literary fiction. There's one paragraph in particular that I won't recite to you here because I hate it when people do that. I find it very cringy. I might put it in the description. It's probably the most beautiful paragraph that I've read in a genre book. Even based just on the prose alone, it is by far the best book that I've read. The story is also quite interesting. It's about a kind of psychoanalyst who uses a piece of technology that allows him to have a mutual lucid dream with his patients. And he is approached by someone who asks to be trained to be one of these analysts. And it's a story of their relationship, their evolving relationship over the course of the training. There's some other stuff going on around that. There's talking dogs that are very reminiscent, again, of City by Clifford Simak. There's some kind of peripheral talk of space travel, just the, the kind of most cursory world building. The main character arc of the protagonist and the other main character is just beautifully told, vivid, psychedelic imagery. It's very, very new wavy in its sensibility and in its storytelling. And in fact, much like Brunner, it is a little bit experimental. It's a beautiful book and one that I would like to reread at some point because I was left with the feeling that there was a lot of subtlety that I missed the first time through. 
This accomplishes more than a dozen of these put together could possibly accomplish. This is a genuine, honest to God piece of literature with a capital L. So is this, so is this. That's why I like reading the older stuff. And now I will pick a book at random from my list of 308 unread genre books. And I am duty bound to finish whatever the phone decrees I read. The best of CM Cornbluth. I am perfectly happy with that. This happens to be one of my favorite covers of any book that I own. I've read uh, one or two stories by Cornbluth and I absolutely loved it. I was kind of hoping that I would roll this one at some point. Okay, thanks for watching guys.